All right, we've been in this rhythm series for, this is the sixth week, the sixth study in this series, and uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed this series, man. This is more than a series, though. The rhythm is the word of the year, so although we're ending the rhythm series, we're not going to end being in rhythm, okay? So here's the deal. You guys, if you don't have the message note binder, if you kind of knew, grab it. It's, they're free. They're at the Connection Center. Go watch these sermons online. We have our notes online as well. Because here's my hope, here's my prayer, is that these six rhythms, that you would, you'd make them your cadence for the year. Because like, here's the deal. All of us begin the year with high hopes, expectation, maybe resolutions and goals. And then the year kind of happens, and we all just drift, don't we? We all end the year, and we look back, and we're so far from where we wanted to be, where we said we were going to be. And, and so I, I believe that the key here is not new goals, new, rhythm, new, new resolutions. It's a new rhythm. It's a new rhythm. And so, so I hope that these six rhythms will just guide your cadence. It'll guide your year. I believe if they do, man, you're going to have the best year of your life, man, if you can make these six things the rhythm of your year, okay? And I'm excited about this last one, what we're closing it off with an, such an important rhythm to get into if this is going to be, if this year is going to be different, man, we got we to gotta get into this sixth rhythm. Let me give you Matthew chapter 11 one more time from the paraphrase, message paraphrase version. Um, here's Jesus speaking. He says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? And we've been talking about that word religion a little bit, that, that at the core, G Jesus, like Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. And like, this is, it wasn't supposed to be like a hard force thing. It's, so Jesus says, this ain't religion. Come, and I'm going to talk to you about this. Jesus said, come to me. I want to talk to you about that invitation. Because at the heart of it, that's the invitation. Jesus is saying, come to me. I want you to get close enough that you actually walk with. Have you ever like been walking with someone, maybe in the mall, or you're walking, and then you all just get in the same step, left, right, left, right? Jesus is going, look, I want, come, come, stop doing that stuff and just get close to me. Walk with me long enough, and I promise you, you'll get in stride. You just get in stride. Just come, come with me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life, and I'll show you how to do it. You'll just, come on, let's do this thing. Get in step together. Walk with me. We're going to talk about that today, this, this sixth rhythm, to get in close and walk with Jesus. And not only walk, but he says, walk with me and work with me. Some of you like the walking, don't like the working. That was last Sunday, a rhythm of serving, like God has a good work for you. He's got a good work. And some of you like working, but you don't like walking. Not like that. Don't let me get too close and that, you know, feeling stuff and all that. You know, I can, yeah, yeah. No, we need both. Walk with me and work with me and watch. Come on. Watch how I do, I do it, he says. And then he says, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Now, let me tell you something. I waited till week six about this unforced rhythm of grace thing. And I waited till this week to talk, to tell you this about it. Any new rhythm that you're trying to get into, you got to force it at first. Any new rhythm or habit or routine that you are starting doesn't come naturally or easy. You actually have to work at that thing a little bit. Now, and the reason why I waited till the week six tell you, because I need you to get in a different mindset, because at the heart of it, this is not a work, it's not a duty, it's a delight, it's a relationship. But, but if you come away with Jesus and walk with him enough, it may, this whole like prayer and fasting thing, we're talking about a rhythm of prayer and fasting. For some of you never fasted before, and that was work. That was work to like, oh, and to, to, to discipline yourself to pray and, and, and this whole silence and solitude and actually stopping for a day and disciplining that, and a, a discipline of devotion and rhythm of devotion. And these things insert like, it's, it's a little bit of, you got to force it a little bit at first, right? You do, but it's not supposed to stay that way. After you, you, you're walking in that and you're developing the new habits and the new routine, it, it, it's supposed to be this unforced rhythm of grace. But I just want you to know here at week six, it doesn't mean it's not hard. It doesn't mean it doesn't take work. It doesn't mean to start these new habits and new routines and, and new rhythms that it's not going to take a little discipline because it does. 
to do it. But, but, but you get close enough, I'm telling you, it's not going to stay there at this forced discipline. It's going to become the cadence of your life. It's going to become the unforced rhythm of grace. He says, I won't lay anything heavy or, like, or ill-fitting. He's saying, you were made for this. This isn't like, you're not going to be like, oh, this is so heavy and so hard. No, no, no. You were made for this cadence. You were made to walk with Jesus. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly as we walk this thing out. So today, sixth rhythm that we're going to talk about is, and if you really are going to have like a, you're going to get in rhythm this year and going to have a better year and then our relationships have to get healthy. Our relationships have, so today I want to talk to you about a rhythm of healthy community, healthy relationships. And Jesus modeled this for us, and all throughout this series we've been looking at Jesus. We've been looking at the rhythm. Because like we pattern our life after so many things. We pattern our life after like, like other people, well, our desires, our parents, other wants, you know, all so many other things, what, what, the media has told us to do, what academia has told us to do, what all these things, but I, what I'm saying is like, look, let's pattern our life after the rhythms of Jesus. Let's follow what he did. Let's get in step with him, and let's see the outcome that that, that happens. So, so what we're going to do today is look at the, how Jesus like, modeled and, and handled like, relationships. We're going to look at his relationship model, like how he, how he did it. And, and then we're going to get really practical, too, like, like, and then figure out like, uh, how... How do we get our relationships healthy then, in a healthy rhythm, and, and, and maybe, you know, make some, make some decisions about our relationships as well today. Here's Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Jesus said this, I will build what? My church, he says, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So here's the deal. Jesus came on a, not to, on a mission, not to start a religion, but a movement. And, and he, did, he could have built it in a lot of ways. But how Jesus decided to build his church, listen, was through relationships. That's that's how he decided to build his church. And I want you to see, we're going to study Jesus' relationships today. And we're going to glean from how he handled and dealt and, and where he invested himself in relationship. Because this is the genius of Jesus. I'm telling you, it is just genius the way that he started this world-changing movement that you and I are here today because of the way that Jesus started this movement through relationships that would trickle out thousands of years later to us here. And really what it, what it boils down to is like, is how he spent his time. Because you're, when you're talking about relationships, this is literally, it, it is a time question. Who are you spending your time with? Who are you spending the most time with? And this was the genius of Jesus. Jesus was so disciplined in who got his time. So, so I want you to, like, like we're going to look at this. We're going to look at who, Je- who Jesus spent his time with and who he was in relationship with and what we can kind of learn from that. But it's almost like an outer circle, like, okay, this is like, you know, he spent some time with these people and then kind of going more time with these people, more time, more time, all the way to kind of like more time through the circle. So take some notes with me. Let's study how Jesus did relationship, okay? Here's the first group would be this outer circle would be the crowd. He would spend some time in the crowd. Write it down like this. He taught the crowd. So we see that in the Gospels, right? Jesus is preaching in the kingdom. He came to declare this kingdom and he's teaching and, and preaching. He's doing signs and wonders and, and, and miracles. And, and so he's talking to the crowd. Um, now, but Jesus didn't live for the crowd. He didn't. In fact, there were times where, where he would heal somebody in the crowd, and he would tell them, hey, don't tell nobody I did that. Just don't, don't, don't tell them. What is, like, if you're starting a movement, what like a marketing nightmare, right? It's like, are you kidding me? Tell everybody. Get the word out there. But Jesus, this is why. Jesus did not want the platform of this movement to be on top of preaching or crowds or multitudes, but through relationship. It was not, this was not the vehicle that would be the foundation of the movement he was starting. Is it important? Sure, sure, sure. Is it an important component of it? But it wasn't the vehicle that he chose to start a movement called the Church of Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 4, verse 1 says Jesus began to teach 
beside the Sea of Galilee, and he would often teach in places like this. And, and it says a very large crowd, and some translations say a multitude gathered around him. It actually says that he, he, he put out a boat further into the sea because so, they were just thronging around him, and he, would, and he taught there from... So that's the... But he had the crowd, and he didn't... Although there's a lot of stories about him in the crowd, he actually didn't spend most of his time in the crowd. He actually spent more time with this next group. If it's like a circle, he, had, oh, he spends time with the crowd. Yeah, and then you go in a little bit further, and Jesus actually spent time with, um, and this, this next relationship group is what's called the 72. I don't know if you know that. They're, just, they're not mentioned a lot in the, in the Gospels, but they are there. Write it down like this, that Jesus mobilized the 72. This was a smaller, more intimate group to Jesus that he spent more time with, and he gave them specific assignments. And, and he asked for a big commitment from these, these 72, and he didn't give them, by the way, any resources to do it. In Luke chapter 10, verse 1, here's what it says. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. So these guys would go ahead of him and, and proclaim Jesus and get it ready. And, and if you go read like Luke chapter 10, the whole thing, he told them specifically, expect opposition when you go into that town. And don't expect any earthly reward. How many of you like that job description? Anyone? Anyone? Right? So this is, this is like, but, but this is, okay, you spent more time with the, the 72. And then there's another group. As you get closer into the, into the, the relational circle of, of Jesus is the one you're probably a little bit more f- familiar with, and that's the 12. So write it down like this. He actually trained personally the 12. He chose the 12 to, these are the ones he chose to be with him. Come be with me, walk with me, check my cadence. He taught them. And, and he gave them assignments too. But he also shared with them his daily life. Come on, come on, come see how I do this. I need you guys to get a little bit. And, and, and this, is, this is the genius of Jesus. So much so that these disciples of Jesus would see this model of, of pouring themselves into a small group of people. This was Jesus' small group. That, that they would, after Jesus would go and ascend to heaven, they would develop the same system in the local church and, and meet with small groups as well. And we're all here. We're all here as a byproduct of Jesus' small group. Every one of us. Mark chapter 3 says like this. Then he appointed the 12 that they might be there to, to be with him. Come on, come with me. I, I, you you got to get this cadence, guys. And that he might... Send them out to preach and to have authority and to drive out demons. This was was Jesus' small group. Some scholars believe that Jesus actually spent 70% of his waking hours with this group. Now, I got to believe that, you know, there's a lot in the Gospels that you can kind of infer that are not really there. But I believe our, for instance, like it says Jesus ate like two times. But I think he ate more, right? You know what I mean? Or it never says he used the bathroom. Maybe you don't like to think of Jesus using the bathroom, but I'm pretty sure Jesus used the bathroom. So, but here's, so here's what I'm saying. It never says that Jesus said no to people wanting to meet with him and take his time. But he had to. He had to. In order for him to have a healthy rhythm of relationship, to be in community with the right people, investing with the right 70% of his time to 12 people to train and get in cadence, to go start a world-changing movement called the local church. Like, he had to. I'm sure there's a lot of people that wanted Jesus' time or healing or touch or something. But Jesus had this uh, uh, discipline of in fact, there was, Jesus was, in, in Matthew chapter 12, it's not in your notes, but in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus was teaching a crowd. He was actually teaching the crowd. Disciples were there and everything, but, but it was with the crowd. And he was getting in some great kingdom teaching. He was, t- he was actually healing on the Sabbath, and they're like, what's the Sabbath? And so he's teaching about the kingdom principles of the Sabbath, and then, and then he's teaching about the demon possessed. And, and, like, and, and so it was like great teaching. Then all of a sudden, his mother and his brother come. And they send in someone to go get Jesus. Hey, Jesus, come out here. and talk. It's time to go, Jesus. And, and Jesus 
The guy comes in and says, hey, Jesus, your mother and your brother are out here. They're asking you to go outside while he's teaching the crowd. And Jesus says, who is my mother and my brother? These here are my mother and my brother. Anyone who does the will of my father is my mother and my brother. What was Jesus doing? Listen, if you don't have boundaries, you will never have healthy relationships. You have to. You have to protect and be intentional about where your time is going, that it's going to the right relationships. If you are going to stay in a healthy rhythm, you're going to have to have some boundaries. So he, tra he trained the 12. And then, did you know there was even another circle, another group of relationships beyond that? Hey, write it down like this, that Jesus actually confided in three people. There was, there was not just the 12, but there was an inner, I call it an inner circle, an inner circle of, that Jesus actually confided in three of the disciples. Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 17, look at, after six days, Jesus took with him, look, Peter, James, and John. All throughout the Gospels, you see this show up. Three, these three, Jesus will pull them aside, Peter, James, John, the brother of James, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. Now, I don't, I wonder what the other nine were thinking. Were they like, man, that's messed up, Jesus. Why don't we get to go? Here's the deal. Listen, these three, Peter, James, and John, they were taught things that the other disciples were never taught. They were shown things that the other disciples never got shown. They were revealed to them. That they, they were prayed over prayers that, that, they, that the other disciples never heard. Those prayers. So, so here's why you, you, need an inner, you need an inner circle. Someone said, like, like this inner circle of Peter, James, and John, they said, well, you need someone who's like the, the fun, brave one like Peter. You need the wise one like James, and you need the one you love like John. I don't know if that's it, but, but I just know you need an inner, an inner circle, okay? Here's, here's where you need the inner circle, in your high moments and your low moments. Let me show you. I don't think it's in your notes, but Jesus invited the inner circle to the glory moments, the celebrated moments. Look at it. Mark chapter 9, it says this. After six days, Jesus took again Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were alone. So they're away from the road. And look what happens. There, he was transfigured before them, literally transformed. This is called the Mount of Transfiguration. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. He showed them the glorified body and nature of the Son of God, and only them. No one else saw this and would ever see it. He called them a little closer and said, I want you guys to see something. He called them the closer. They said, experience this glory with me. And not only the glory, those high moments and the celebrated moments and the glory moments that you need to, you need to pull, you need an inner circle. But you also need an inner circle for your low moments. Do you know Jesus had low moments? Mark chapter 14 reveals one of those moments where it says he took, again, look, Peter, James, and John, his inner circle, along with him, and he began to be, look at this, deeply distressed and troubled. Now look, this is, this is Jesus, the Son of God but fully man, with all the man emotions. And, and this, is, this is what we're not good at sometimes, you guys. We're not good at, when we get to the troubling moments of our life, those stressful moments that the, we're, most of the time we isolate ourselves. We close ourselves off. We shove it down. And maybe you tell someone after the trial or something like that, or maybe you don't even ever tell anybody. But Jesus, look, and I don't, I think that there is the humanity part, wanted someone there, but I think there's also, like, Jesus is intentionally doing this to show us the rhythm. He's like, guys, I want you to model, I, model this. You, you don't do it alone. You can't do it alone. Gra grab yourself some people, some, to pour yourself into, but get in inner circle for these moments. And look what he says. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. This is what he's saying. Like, I, I would rather die than go to the cross. I don't, I don't want to, but rather not. So he said, stay here and keep watch. Like you need some people in your life, an inner circle that can just stay with you, who can keep watch with you when you're stressed, where you don't keep it in and ball it up, but you're, you got an inner circle where you say, hey, 
can, can you pray with me? Can you keep watch with me? Okay? This, this, is, this, this is how Jesus modeled healthy relationships for us. And it didn't stop there. In fact, there's a, there is now at the core of this circle, from the crowd to the 72, to the 12, to the 3, and right there at the core is he actually had a relationship with himself. Right down like this, he led himself. <laughs> so, so this is where all leadership starts. This is where all healthy relationships start with you relating to yourself. So relating, uh, you know, healthy to self precedes you having a healthy relationship with others. Self-leadership precedes team leadership and, and public influence. If you can't lead yourself, then you can't or you shouldn't lead others. You have to be able to lead yourself. And if you, if you can't relate to yourself in a healthy way, meaning you don't think well about yourself, you don't, you don't treat yourself well, like, like, then you're not going to be able to relate to others in a healthy way. Why? Why? Because you're trying to get from others what God always intended for you to get from yourself. And, and you will inevitably, listen to me, if that's the case, if you're, not, if you're not relating to self, healthy, and leading self, you will inevitably be, be codependent and insecure. You will depend on others what God has already given you, but you don't have the revelation yet because you don't lead yourself there. Mm, come on, I pray that's good preaching, Pastor. Amen, somebody. Okay. Matthew chapter 14. This is why, this is why Jesus had to get away. Get away. Look what it says. After he dismissed them. So there were times where Jesus was like, I'm done. Get out. Like, um, uh, it's time. It's the boundary. I can't let this slip. This is important. This relationship here is important. It's time for you to be dismissed. And he went up to a mountain by himself to pray. What a selfish person. No, 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 no. He wanted to be alone so that he can be with his father. He can, he can do this inner work. And this is our this is This is what... What a rhythm we need to get into to have healthy relationships. So what do we do? How do we develop this rhythm? Here's, here's the key. Here's the key. Write it down like this. You've got to choose your relationships carefully. I'm telling you, your relationships, if we just think about just this year, this year, it's going to make or break your year, guys. Ladies, it's going to make or break it. You've got to choose those relationships carefully. They say that you're... You are the byproduct of your five closest relationships. N listen, it's not the five people you like the most. Because everyone, like you have people that you like more, respect more, admire more, all that stuff, but you don't spend time with them. So it's the five people that you spend the most time with. You take those five people, and that's a vision of yourself. Not the people that you like the most, not the people you think are you know, the closest to you, my closest. No, no, no. The five people you spend the most time with, you see a vision of yourself. See, casual friends can be the result of my circumstances, but my close friends need to be the result of my choices. A ca like, oh, because it's my work buddy. I sit next to him. We take lunch at the same time. We're in the same classes, whatever. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Casual friends are a result of circumstances, but my close friends, these ones in the inner circle, no, no, no. I got to choose those wisely. I got to choose them. Proverbs 27, 19 says this. A mirror reflects a man's face. But if you want to know what he, that guy really is, who he really is, you take a look at his friends. That, that's who he is. See, the fact is, the closer I am to a person, the greater they influence my life. So I need to choose my relationships and my friends wisely. Okay, there's, there's four things. If we're going to get in a healthy rhythm, of relationship, a, a, a rhythm of healthy relationships, then I think we need to, we need to do four things. And maybe, maybe you need to do all of them, maybe do some of them, but I think every one of us need to do at least one of these four things if we're going to get into a rhythm of healthy relationship. Okay, here's, here's the first thing. I think most of us can actually say yes to this one. We need to nurture our important relationships. You know, the, the, the ones that matter most those important relationships and for a lot of us who are honest the, there are some important relationships 
that are suffering right now. And those relationships are in the condition they're in based on how you've nurtured them, right? Someone said, well, my marriage isn't just what it used to be, Pastor. Well, that's not your marriage's fault. That's not your marriage's fault. Your relationship is where it is based on how well you've nurtured it up to this point. Amen. Okay? So one guy told me, Pastor, the fire's gone. The fire's just gone. There's no... That's like looking at a fireplace that doesn't have any fire in it and going, that's a terrible fireplace right there. Bad fireplace. <laughs> Stupid fireplace. No, oh, ain't nothing wrong with that fireplace. You just need to put another log on the fire. Hey, brother, get up out of your lazy chair. Get a log and put it on the fire again. Look, all relationships take work. And just because they take work, do not make it a bad relationship. you got to nurture your most important relationships. You just do. They take, they take work. you got to work on it. And the enemy knows this. That there is power. There's so much power in your relationships. And who you are is going to be a byproduct of that. So where he's going to attack is going to be in the area of your relationships. And, and if any area, it's going to be this one right here, the important ones. I'm talking about the covenant ones. I'm talking about the, your spouse, your kids. I'm about maybe even that, that, inner, that inner circle that the enemy's trying to bring division to and separate you guys from mentally and physically. you got to work at that thing. you got to nurture your important relationship. That's one thing. If you want to, you want to get into a rhythm of a healthy relationship this year, you got to start working again, dude. Come on, sister. You got to come on. You got to nurture this fire back to life, okay? And then number number two, maybe maybe some of you need to restore some broken relationships. Maybe there's some broken. So can I tell you that the pain of fixing it is not nearly as bad as the pain of keeping it broken. Because sometimes we're not like investing into that thing and repairing that thing and restoring that thing because like it's going to be hard. It's going to hurt to go through that. It's going to be a pain to go through it. But listen to me. Oftentimes the pain of keeping it broken, the, the, the long-term pain of that thing staying broken is not, it, it's so much more than the pain of restoring it. Now, I get it. Sometimes you can't restore every relationship because they don't even want to come and play ball, Right? But there's, there's a scripture. It's not in your notes. Romans chapter 12, verse 18. It says this, but as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. As far as it depends on you. Now listen, if you can't live at peace with them, you live at peace with yourself. You make peace in your heart. You say, God, I'm going to let them go. I'm going to forgive them. They don't even need to come. We don't need to talk about it. I'm just, in my heart, peace. One of the seven elements of the Lord's Prayer. We studied this in our 21 Days of Prayer podcast. Some of you guys listened to that. But one of the seven elements that Jesus gave us as like a, a model of, of prayer that we would actually pray every day. He says, like, pray like this, was, was, was this. One of the seven elements is forgive us as we forgive others. That Jesus was saying, this is a daily choice you're going to have to make because relationships are hard and people are difficult. They can hurt and they can cause pain and cause wounds and you're gonna have to make a daily choice to forgive them as we are forgiven can i tell you a secret like i forgive people sometimes not because i want to but because i need forgiveness it's a little bit selfish isn't it i know i know but sometimes i'm like nah i need forgiveness let me get that off me i forgive you i'm releasing that in jesus name okay because i can't i don't want that sticking on me no 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 I don't want that bitterness up in here. I need, I need forgiveness. I need the grace of God, so I'm not going to swallow that thing. No, no. Someone said holding up forgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person suffers. Or, or lighting yourself on fire and hoping the other person dies of smoke inhalation. That's stupid, right? That's stu like forgiveness is not for them. You're not hurting them by holding forgiveness. You're hurting yourself. So if we're going to get healthy in relationship then we're going to have to nurture the important ones. We're going to have to actually maybe restore some of the broken ones. I don't know how many of these are going to connect to you getting healthy, but here's another one. we got to sever some harmful relationships. There are some relationships that are, that are, that are harmful, and at the very least, maybe redefine. Maybe right next to sever, right, ne right next to it, the word redefine. Because maybe not sever, but maybe, the, maybe there's some relationships that just need to be redefined. And notice I did not say your husband or wife. You can't go home and say, dude, pastor said, you gone. No, 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 I didn't say that. I didn't say that. 
But you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. It's the relationship that you know you're not supposed to be in. And you know it. And, and I, I, it's, that, it's that relationship that they're just taking you the wrong direction. They're the wrong influence in your life. Or even speaking to, to someone today, you know that relationship has gone, you crossed the line. They crossed the line with flirting. It's, and you know it. And you're lying to yourself and you're betraying yourself. And that's gone over the line. And you know it in your heart that if this continues, and maybe you're saying, I'm strong enough, and it's okay, it won't. But in your heart, you know it's across the line. Intentions are not pure. And for the love of God and your marriage, you need to sever that thing before, before you make a mistake. Sever or, or redefine. You know, re, you, there's relationships that we do. We need to, we need, and, and some of these, I'm telling you, may, may land, maybe all of them, some of them. Here's one we're going to kind of sit on for a while and, and talk about. We need to also, if we're going to get healthy, rhythm of healthy relationships, we've got to initiate some meaningful relationships. Like, we got to start some that you don't have. And the truth is, a lot of us just don't do this. We're not good at this. Like, we all want friends. We all want mentors. We all want healthy relationships. But it, we just don't do the work to initiate them, right? We just, we're not good at the awkward initiation of, like, of uh, getting some healthy people into our lives. But all of us need meaningful relationships. So how do you initiate them? And how do you initiate the ones that matter? I'm going to give you the ones that matter, modeling after Jesus and how he measured his time and his commitment and his relationship. Let me give you four relationships that you need to initiate. And maybe some of them are, are you're, you're in a good rhythm, like, yeah, I got that one. Maybe there's a few of them that you need to strengthen or initiate or develop a little bit more. Um, but find the ones, like if you're going to get into, into this rhythm of healthy relationship, then these are four areas that, that we got to, we have to develop. Okay, here's number one. We got to develop a relationship. I wrote it like this, intentionally. Develop my relationship with what? My church. And my church. I wrote it that way. Everyone needs my church. And it doesn't have to be this church. But it does have to be a church. Like I'm inviting you to, but you need, listen, you need a place to belong. You do. We, we everyone created for this. We need a place to belong. In fact, there are over 30 verses in the New Testament alone that you cannot even fulfill if you do not belong to like a local church family. Ephesians chapter 2, 19 says this. You are not attenders, you're members of God's very own family. And you belong in God's household with every other Christian. Now, I realize there's a bunch of you that are probably not members. You're actually attenders, which I believe that's okay. Like, I believe that there's, there needs to be, in the body of Christ, the, the grace and the freedom for seasons and stages, like, like where there is nothing demanded of people. Like, like, you don't need to give anything, serve anything, do anything, say anything. You just come and sit and breathe and rest and let the Holy Spirit. Like, that's okay. I want you to know... That's okay to sit and soak, but listen to me. But it's not okay to stay there. It's not. That's not healthy to stay in that place. Sometimes, maybe you need time to heal. Maybe time to unlearn or relearn some things. But you need a place to belong. You know, you'll get the best out of any relationship when you commit to that relationship. It takes a commitment to, like, like, Veronica and I, we were in, like, an attender kind of relationship. We used to be. You know, I date her. Like, take her on a date and bring her back home. We were just, like, attender-like. But then we became members, you know. Marry that girl. I mean, you know, there's, there's some privileges and benefits to membership. You know what I'm saying? Okay? So, but there's also responsibilities. There's, pri there's privileges and responsibilities. But let me tell you, it's so much better. It, it, it's just better to belong, and you'll never discover the best about a relationship that you are not committed to. Now, you cannot commit to every relationship, but there are core relationships that both Jesus modeled, the scriptures give us, that, that this is one of those core relationships that need time and my commitment that I need to be relating to. And in, in the Bible, the, the church, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it the, the Apostle Paul likens the church to a body. There's multiple scriptures that actually talk about that. Um, that the church is like a body. We're all members of, of the body, remember? And, and so 
the, the power is not in, in the hand. The power is in the hand finding connection to the arm. That's the power. The hand by itself has no power. The hand is only powerful when it finds the arm. Okay, let me give you an analogy. It's kind of gruesome. I'm sorry, but I mean, bear with me. A little. It's, a little, it's a little gruesome of an analogy, but I, go there with me for just, for just a moment because I want to make an illustration. If, if a child were to get their hand cut off, and, and then it healed, you healed it up, but you go back to that child one year later, the whole body would have matured, and every member of that body would have grown, but the hand would have been decayed. Could it be that some of you are watching other people go from glory to glory and, and change and be transformed and grow and mature in their attitude, their character, their gifting, their, their relationship, just because they're connected to the body? Maybe you're hearing the same messages, maybe even more, but because you're not connected to the source, you're not growing like you should. Okay, so, so we, need to, we, we need to develop. Here's one of the, maybe some of you are there, like, oh, I got my, my church, amen. I think you just need a church, you need a my church, where you take ownership of that thing. Like, like that's, that's your chair that you're sitting on, you know what I mean? That's your chair. Those are your donuts. That's your coffee. That's your binder. Go get it. It's your binder, right? Like, you need, like everyone needs a, a my church, all right? The, the, the second area that we need to develop is a relationship with godly friends, Everyone, everyone needs, we need to have a set of that core, right? That those godly friends, people that you're going to be close with. So how do you know that they're actually godly friends, though? You want to know how? Being around them makes you more godly. That's, that's how you know. You need some friends in your life that are pulling you up. They're, they're lifting you up in the things of God into the right direction. You know, as I was studying for this message, I... My mind went back to old school. Went back like to the seventies and the eighties. There's this TV show. Have you ever watched Cheers? You ever watched Cheers? Here, okay. So my mind went to the theme song, Cheers. You remember the theme song of Cheers? It went like this: Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Amen. Amen to that. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Yes, it would. Wouldn't you like to get away? Yeah. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. And they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see that our troubles are actually all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. Now, that's a bar, you guys, okay? <laughs> but it should be the church. And, and, and I would say, I dare say, that is like the church. That's why we have small groups here at Discovery Church. They're launching today 107 small groups that we have for you to get connected. They're not just things to do. This is like, this is for your health, for your healing. We hear testimony all the time of marriages and people walking things out, and working things out because of the power of groups. We got all kinds of groups, all kinds of groups, man. And, and this is why, like, you need, you need to be in a group. Because real life change doesn't happen on Sunday. You know what I mean? Real life change happens in the context of relationships. See, here's the trick. Can I tell you a trick? All these groups you're going to see, you're going to be able to categorize them like, oh, where's Mondays and Tuesday groups and Thursdays groups or men's groups and women's groups or couples groups. There's like a search engine you can categorize, find the one that's right for you. There's a bunch of them. But let me tell you a secret. I really don't care what they're studying. Okay, what kind of I do? I mean, I know, the, like we look for theology. We don't want people sinning up in there and stuff like that. So, so there is a little bit, but it's really not the most important thing to me. It really, you know why? Because I have never seen, seen anyone's life change because of information. Life, life changes because of our relationships. And I can prove it to you. <laughs> if I ask you, name me the, ten, the last 10 sermons I preached. You wouldn't be able to name them. I can't even name them. Stop. I preach them. I can't name those sermons, all right? But if I asked this, if I said, hey, name 10 people that impacted your life, whether good or bad, you go, mm, 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 mm. You'd be able to do it. Why? Because your life is shaped by relationships, not information. This is, this is God's, this is the power of relationship and why God actually uses them this way. And this is the way the, 
the church is operating. The New Testament church operated this way. They would worship in Sunday services, the, the, the New Testament church in Acts. Sometimes thousands of people would gather together. But then they would gather from house to house in small groups. Acts 2, 44 says this. All the believers met together constantly and shared everything with each other. Circle that word in your hand. Circle shared or underline that word or something because that's kind of like, here's the secret to your groups. When you go to a group, like, what's your, the secret is this. Get to a comfort level where you're able to share. Yeah. Well, share what? The real you. You know, not the crowd you. Yeah. See, you know, Jesus had that crowd persona, the, the platform persona. Many people only have the who they are in the public persona, and they don't have any other circles where they let people know who they really are behind the scenes. What you need is you need, you need to let people know who you, now look, here's the, you have secrets. You do. Every one of us. We, you have secrets. I have secrets. It's okay. It's okay to have secrets. Where it's not okay and where the Bible and, and God is not okay with you having secrets, it's not okay if no one else knows my secrets. It's okay to have secrets. Hey, Jesus told Peter, James, and John secret things that he didn't share with anybody else. Like, it's okay to have boundaries and secrets. That's okay. You just can't be the only one to know your secrets. You know why? Because I'll always stay as sick as my secrets. I'll always stay as sick as my secrets. We'll always have like, oh, why can't I? Why do I keep messing up here? Why do I keep clicking on that? Why do I keep messing with this addiction? Well, you got you to gotta let someone other than God know. You got to, because when you're honest, it's the first step to freedom. Yeah, and we kind of know that. I think a lot of us know that. And the real question is, why don't we then? There's a lot of hesitancy. Like a lot of you know, like when I open up and share, that's actually like going to do something. We know that, and, and, and we don't. You know what I've discovered? Why One of the big reasons why we don't is because some of us have before, and we got betrayed. Or someone let us down. We got disappointed. Listen to me, a bunch of you, you don't have the relationships you need because you had the wrong relationships in the past. And, and you've allowed the stain and the pain of that experience to keep you from what you need now. And that, that would be like a pot of boiling hot water gets spilled on your leg and you go, well, that's it. I'm just, I'm done with water. No, 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 no. You, you let the abuse of something keep you from something that actually is keeping you alive. And I'm encouraging you. I know it hurt. I know it created a scar. But listen, you still need relationships. You, you, need, you, you need a group. If this is going to be your house, my church, you need a group. You need it. It's not for us. It's for you. Okay? Now, here's the third area. You, you need to initiate, develop some things. We're going to get into a rhythm of healthy relationship. We got to, not just a group. I think we need a relationship with a team. We got we to get a relationship with a team, man. So for the first time ever at Discovery, we have over 700 people on our dream team. Isn't that cool? Give it up for our dream team. Come on now. All the people serving and kids and parking and greeting behind the scenes on stages. It's awesome. Not only is it like, man, we're making a difference. Like this is a team that's making a difference. Not only is it that, but it's just fun being on a team. You ever been on a team before? It's fun being on a team, man. You, you need to know this though. You'll never do anything significant in your life alone. Yeah. Never. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 8 and 9 says this. There was a man who was actually all alone. He had neither son or brother. And because of that, look, he just worked, work, 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 work. He just tried to put all of his energy into work, and there was no end to his worry and his toil, and he could never be content. So what's the answer then? Next verse. Well, two are better than one. That's why. That's the answer. And not just because they're fun, too. Man, they got a good return for their labor. Like, it feels good to get something good done. God made you for this. He made you to make a difference and to feel the satisfaction of going, we did it. We made an impact. Man, we were making an impact for God's kingdom. Like, you were made for that. And there's like dozens of teams here at Discovery Church for you to get connected. Dozens of them. Look, if this is going to be the year where you get in rhythm into healthy relationships, then you need to start giving your time and creating the boundaries to be healthy in the right relationships. So there is there's the 
relationship with the church that needs to be maybe developed for some of you. Maybe some of you are like, no, that one's good. Well, there's a, there's, you need to develop some godly friends. For, it, for some of you, maybe it's the God, I mean, you, need, you need to actually develop a team where you're actually making a difference for God and for his kingdom. And then number four, really where it all, the inner core, where everything else comes out of, it's developing your relationship with God. And, and write that fill in and don't, don't click your notebooks or anything just yet. I want to kind of just have, talk about this because everything births out of this, this r- healthy relationship with God. So can, can you imagine with me for a moment? Because I think, have you ever imagined what your life would be like if you went all in with God? I think some of you have. Some of you have maybe fantasized or, or, or God just dropped some thoughts. You're like, what would your life be like if you really just surrendered it all to God? You know what I've noticed about people over the years in, in church and ministry is that people like to try God. You know? Oh, okay. I guess I'll, 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 I'll give it a try. It's like waking up one day and going, oh, you know what? I'm going to play for the NBA today. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're never going to, like, get anything with, like, a big payoff unless you pour everything into it. I think a lot of people just have enough of God to, to get their fire insurance card, right? Right? Just give me enough of God I don't go to hell. I just don't want to burn. How much, like, how much church do I really need? How much of this stuff do I, do I really need to really stay away from that but not on? I don't want to be a fanatic or anything, you know what I mean? You know, we'll call... We, we call fans, you know, like some people give our lives. You give your life to like teams and stuff like that. You spend your extra money for, for stuff and apparel and tickets. And you go to these stadiums or areas and it looks like the book of Psalms. You know what I mean? Everyone's screaming, praising, shouting, lifting up the hands. And yeah, giving, <laughs> look, I'm not going to give the best of myself to, you call, that, that person is called a fan though, right? When, when you do all that though and you give, you give, time and your resources, your energy and, and, and whatever's like, like you're giving, you're pouring it into what matters most, they say that's a fanatic. But I'm telling you, I'm, I'm not giving the best of myself to anything other than God. When you go on with Jesus, like when I was 20 years old, I was a Christian in name, like I believed, like I, I believed God, but I needed to go all in. Like I, never, I didn't go all in. And Following Jesus, this thing, you guys, this Christianity thing, this church thing, it doesn't work a little bit. It doesn't, like when you, when you give a little bit, it doesn't work that way. It, it was never intended to work and function when you just give a little bit. No, no, I'm, like it, you'll get something out of it and you're here and coming and going and, and, and like you get a little, sure, you're going to get a little bit. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. But it was not intended this way, to work that way. It was intended, it was intended. This unforced rhythm thing where, because if you give a little, I promise you, you're going to get disappointed, you're going to get frustrated, it ain't going to work right, you're going to quit again, you're going to go on your little binge again, you're going to go off, you're going to come back, and then you're going to go like that. You're going to do all that. Because it just doesn't work. It doesn't work the way that Jesus intended, this unforced rhythm of grace thing. That's why Jeremiah chapter 29 says it like this. If God's saying, speaking prophetically here. God says, if you look for me, with your whole heart that's when you'll find me like God, God does not want your like you can try to okay I'm gonna get the rhythms I'm praying fast and like, like I'm gonna develop these relationships with church and team and God like if you if you miss this if you miss this developing your relationship with God like like this is what God wants everything else is, is birthed out of this place of being intimate with God like, this is what, man, like, nothing works. Nothing works without this. Your whole heart is what God wants. And when you do, when you do, you're going to catch stride. It may take a little while for you to unlearn and relearn some things, develop some new rhythms and habits. But you're going to catch stride. Listen, you're going to find God. Can I pray that over you? With every head bowed and eye closed, I would just love to pray for you right where you are. Some of you are here today and you got a toe. <laughs> you got your toe in the water. You just trying it out, testing, like, like that's it. You got a little foot in the water. And you know you need to go all in, man. You need to stop trying this thing. You need to stop giving God the little bit. You need to give them all. 
All of you. Surrendered your whole heart and whole life. That's what salvation is, really. That's the moment of salvation. For some of you who have never done that, I'd love to help you out here. For those others of you who need to do it again, maybe you've been around church and religion for a while, but you've never really <laughs> jumped in the water like you went all in. I'm not going to have you come to the front or single you out, but I would love to pray for you right there, right where you are. With every head bowed, I'm just going to count to three in a moment. And what I want you to do is just lift up your hand real, real high if you're saying, said, give God my whole heart today, surrendering the control of your life to Him. Come on, if that's you, I want you to be brave with me. One, two, three, lift up your hand. Come on, lift that up high. I surrender. I'm giving God my whole heart Today, yes, all over this place, yeah, yeah, yes, 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 amen, 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 yeah, yeah, yes, yes, here and here, real high, come on, I want to see, yeah, 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 yes, 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 thank you, God, thank you, God, all over this place, way back there, too, yep, thank you, God, over here, too, yep, yep, thank you, Jesus, go ahead and put your hands down, you know, let me help you with a, with a prayer, you can make it your own, you can whisper it right there, but let me help you with a prayer of this surrender. Say something like this. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today, I surrender. And I give you my whole heart. I declare you're my Lord, my God, my Savior. Come live inside of me and change me. Make me brand new. Thank you, God, for saving me. God, I speak over every person right now that this is the year that we're going to get not only in rhythm, but a rhythm of healthy relationship. God, that, that there's some relationship that needs to start some nurturing, that we're not working at anymore. The fire has gone out and some covenant relationships, and I'm going to stop complaining about it, and I'm putting a log on this fire. I'm going to do some work to nurture my important relationship. There are some relationships that need to be restored that are broken. At the very least, God, right now, right here, I'm releasing them. I'm forgiving them. I'm making peace in my heart, God. There are relationships in this room that need to be severed, that need to be cut. God, give the confidence right now. now God, right now, in the name of Jesus, sever right now. We're cutting it off. We're cutting it off. We're cutting it off. Those are harmful. Those are destructive. Those are pulling the wrong direction. Right now, God, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done with it. I'm severing it right now. There are some relationships that we need to initiate. Help us, God, to step into some healthy community, to, to find a church, to commit and give time to a church. Get, get, some, get a core of godly friends, to get a group, to get a team, start making a difference, God. Let this be the year. Let this be the year. My best year ever, where you're in control. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that today. Amen.